This is Beyond the Big Screen Podcast with your host, Steve Guerra. Thank you for listening to Beyond the Big Screen Podcast, where we talk about great movies and stories so great they should be movies. Find show notes, links to subscribe, and leave Apple Podcast reviews by going to our website, beyondthebigscreen.com. And now, let's go beyond the big screen. Hello, friends. Steve here with a quick announcement about today's episode. This episode is a part of a series that Mustache Chris and I did on the film Iceman. In this episode, we will get into some of the background and the history and the context behind the Iceman and other related characters in this fascinating story. The Iceman, of course, was the serial killer slash mob hitman who developed and created an identity that may or may not have been rooted in fact. We really hope you enjoy these episodes and then which will culminate in the discussion on the film. Before we get on with the show, one thing that you can do that will really help us out is if you can hit the like and subscribe button to this episode if you are listening on YouTube. Or if you're not listening on YouTube, go and like and subscribe to the podcast there. We really hope you enjoy these episodes. We'd love to hear your feedback down in the comments. Let us know what you think and let's get into it. This episode will bring up topics that are not necessarily appropriate for all audiences. Uh, We're going to really try not to be graphic. I mean, in all honesty, we'll try to make it as less graphic as is possible. But we will be talking about mafia and killing and contract killers. So just to let you know in advance... So what we're going to do today, Chris and I are going, we're going to uh, try to build some context on Richard Kuklinski, the Iceman. And this will lead into the next few episodes where we'll talk about mobster Roy DeMeo and then the 2012 movie, The Iceman. We really think you'll enjoy these conversations and really this whole series and the series within a series. Uh, We're going to break down Richard Kuklinski's life into several sections because that's really how the the books break up his life and how he broke up his life and his jailhouse inner series of three or four sets of jailhouse interviews, hours and hours of interviews, really his early childhood, his early life and life in crime, and then his later life in crime. And then his the end where he's finally captured and prosecuted and then his life in jail, which was a whole nother life after life. Just initially, Chris, what did you think overall of Richard Kuklinski? When we started looking into the Iceman, we were like, really started looking into it. Like, yeah, we got to do this guy deserves his own episode because it is really a crazy, crazy story about like. You know, is this guy telling the truth? Is this guy not telling the truth? Is um, how much? How much is he lying? How much is he not lying? It's it, and there's opinions that vary where people say he's lying about everything, and there's people that just take him exactly at his word. And yeah, Richard Kuklinski. I mean, in terms of mafia guys, if you can really call him that, I don't. He's not really a mafia guy. He was kind of around them. I mean, he's his story is fascinating. I remember when the Iceman tapes came out in the late 80s, maybe early 90s on HBO. And it was even too creepy to for me to watch. I remember watching a little bit of it and turning it right off. And then a couple of years ago, I listened to some podcasts about him. I'm like, this is a strange guy. But then watching this movie and then diving into the deep dive of the research that we did, there's so much to him. And I think for me, it's a he really dives into what history is. And I think that we're going to learn a lot more about him, hopefully when historians start looking into a story as opposed to journalists who are looking at it and looking at it in different ways. I think that we're going to learn a lot more about him because like you said, 
there's so much obscured about his story. We re- re- were relying so much on what he said that I don't think, at least for a while, that we'll know the full story of Richard Kuklinski. And it's also just the nature of the mafia in general, where a lot of this stuff is still obscure, like it's still covered up. And yeah, we know a fair amount, but there's a lot of, uh, I mean, if you look, listen to like Sammy the Bull, he puffs himself up and I know a lot of people take his word on a lot of things that went down, but I mean, it, somehow he always makes himself look good and he's, uh, you know, one of the sources for a lot of these journalists and just to like kind of use an example, like Richard Konglitsky is, he's not a household name, but he's pretty, f- he's a pretty famous serial killer. I mean, and the five families, which is, uh, by Celan Rob, I believe that's Rab how you pronounce his name is considered like the Bible of the mafia in the initial prints. They, they weren't even, they mentioned Richard Kuglinski, but they weren't even spelling his name properly. And another guy, Robert Prange, which we'll get into the story too. They, they weren't spelled. They didn't spell his name properly either. And it just kind of shows you like the layers of um, onions. You have to peel back to kind of yeah. get at the core of this story. Let's the, the I guess the logical place to start is in Richard's early childhood. That's another one that you see it develops along the way. And it, if you listen, if you listen or read uh, some of the early accounts, you get a slightly different version of Richard's early life. And then as you in the later accounts, you get a more fleshed out version of his life. What was the early childhood of Richard Kuklinski like in coming up in northern New Jersey in the 1930s, 1940s? It. It sounds like it was like it put as rough as you could possibly imagine. Like they, the whole family grew up poor. I mean, he talks about having to steal food to just, you know, feed himself and to feed the rest of his family. But his parents were something else. Like you would trigger, oh, maybe the mother was a little bit motherly. No, she was uh, abusive. And her, his father, he will actually refers to his mother as just cancer. Like that's how he refers to his mother he doesn't even call her by his name and he doesn't even call his dad by his doesn't even call him dad or father or anything like that he calls him by his first name with stanley and stanley was about as evil as it as a father could be to his own children you know there's a story of him beating uh, one of his younger brothers and just you know punching him in the back of the head and he killed him and you know, and like Richard would get these types of beatings all the time and his brother Joseph. And we're going to talk about his brother, Joseph. It the the whole the way that he was raised, it was like a, if you could set up a scenario to produce somebody like a Richard Kuglinski, uh, like a hitman slash serial killer, you couldn't like pick a better factory to create it. Yeah, it really does seem that with this with his family background that it's. When you look at nature versus nurture, it really took both of them that he was born with the genes or the propensity to be evil. And then every single thing in his life just promoted that it was like an incubator to be evil. Like you said, his father killing his brother uh, and child abuse right in front of Richard and then everybody in the family covering it up. And Richard being so young, he sees his brother, he vividly describes that of seeing his brother laid out dead and he just doesn't understand it. His brother was there one day after and then after the beating that the father regularly gave all of them he's not there anymore. And you could see how that somebody who was wired to wired for that sort of uh, to be a killer and to be, you know, to break bad, you might say everything lined up to just make this guy not right. And I would almost say when you listen to it, his early stories, I almost feel bad for the guy. I, I'm not going to lie. I do because he just didn't have a chance. didn't have a chance you know and then like you pointed out like there's the uh, there's not an exact science to it but there there's a theory that there is like a a psychotic gene 
that certain people get right like uh there's uh, certain people that are born they're not afraid of uh danger mm-hmm. and this is like a lot of people like they're they tend to go into activities like uh race car driving skydiving that type of stuff and the the theory goes is like it doesn't necessarily mean that you yourself are you're going to become psychotic but you pushed in a certain direction you're more likely to have that come out of you and i mean richard yeah he didn't have a chance and not to mention he was like bullied too when he was a kid and yeah he's getting it from all angles yeah, he's he was polish raised in a primarily italian neighborhood in new jersey and so he was mercilessly bullied his mom more or less hated him And you can almost not even blame his mom because she was born in brutal circumstances, grew up in a terrible orphanage uh, where I think they said she might have even been abused in the the orphanage. Like, I, I, you know, in a lot of ways, you uh, it was like mass PTSD of, you know, generations of people. And it's not surprising that it was a more brutal world back then. Not that long ago, like in, you know, depending on how old people are out there, like your grandparents or great grandparents, they lived in that world that was just not as it didn't have as much of a margin as we have today, I think. Steve here with a quick word from our sponsors. And it's also like this particular family lived in this like alternate universe where like Richard talks about it in the, in the, in the confessions of a hitman, the Philip Carlo book where like his father, he kills his brother. And then like, he like slows down for like two months and it's just like, okay. Yeah. And then he just goes right back to it. Like he didn't like at no point did he just, he just started doing the exact same stuff again, but in their mind, it's like, Oh, well, it's been two months, you know, like, yeah. you know, I, <laughs> yeah, I calmed down months. for a bit. Like, you know, like it's just something like it's very difficult for, you know, like a normal human being to really understand. But within that environment, I guess it would kind of make sense where this is just how you were raised. You're just constant abuse around you all the time. And like you pointed out the mother and I think Stanley had a similar kind of upbringing. And then you just, this is how, this is how like uh, people talk about like generational poverty or generational violence. But I mean, this is kind of how it happens. It's like, well, this is how I was raised. What's, why is it any yeah. different for them? Then Richard does his very first murder when he's about 12 years old. He has enough of this bully and he really just goes to beat him with a, uh, I think it was a clothes, the thing you, the pole you hang your clothes on. Yeah. He takes it and he beats this boy to death and he doesn't get caught for it. And I think that's probably, I, I, I'm pretty sure that this is a hundred percent true. And I think that that's what really set him that, Hey, I did this. I can get away with it. Nothing ever happened from it. That's probably the thing that really set him off for the rest of his life. Really? Yeah. And then like, it also started early too with uh, cats and dogs and like inventive ways of like getting rid of cats and dogs. Um, I mean, you know, play our impair psychologist or what have you is, you know, he's having control over these particular, this bully and then those animals lives kind of in the sense, the way his father has control over him. And he wants to have that type of power over other individuals that his father had over him. Mm -hmm. Um, and make sure like nobody else has that type of power over him like his father does or did um yeah i mean and then those are like there's like a you know mutilation of like uh, cats and dogs is usually is usually a good sign of like uh, this person has that type of gene yeah there's a good chance that it doesn't necessarily mean that like kids are some kids are just weird and they do weird things right it doesn't necessarily mean but it, it's it's a sign yeah I think they say there's three things that they look for and you could even have all three of those things like t- torturing animals. And then I can't remember what the two others you could have one of them, two of them, three of them. And it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be a se- serial killer. But if you start seeing those things, it's probably something you should really look out for. Yeah. 
And even with this bully, and um, according to Richard, from because he started reading a bunch of true crime stuff, he, you know, like so to make sure that he didn't get caught, he's like, oh, I got to remove the fingerprints and any dental records, which is just goes to show you that he's like, even at this young age, yeah. he's thinking like he, he he's got he's not he's pretty smart actually because the you know, most 12 year olds probably wouldn't even think of that, but he's thinking about it because Richard was not dumb. And we're going to see that in this next phase of his life where he, he's coming up. He's a small time hood in, in Northern Jersey. He has a small gang that are doing small gang type stuff of stealing and stealing cars, roughing people up. But in the meanwhile, at least according to Richard, and this is something we can talk about, Richard's basically going into the predominantly the west side of Manhattan, and he admits to that, that it was almost one neighborhood. I think it was the Hell's Kitchen neighborhood, which was right across the river from where he lived in New Jersey. He was going over there and killing vagrants, killing homeless people, killing people he would get into bar fights with. And it was, he was killing them in all sorts of different manners, using guns, using knives, beating them. And he was using the knowledge that he had gained through these um, true crime novels to just kill people. And it's kind of amazing that he, it's amazing in one way. And it, you can kind of see how he did get away with it in the 1950s of killing a lot of people like we don't know exactly but he did certainly killed a lot of people yeah and it, it was like also the randomness of it and i think he mentioned something about like the the methods in which he did it too he would always try to change it up so like the cops wouldn't be able to figure like oh this seems to be happening like a couple of times in a row now where you know he like you pointed out he was just people i think at one point he used a crossbow he just yeah. happened to get a crossbow and just wanted to see what it would do and then like just random homeless people a lot of the times which i mean a lot of the times these people they don't have i mean they have family but you know their family is estranged from them and they don't know where they are and it takes a while to identify exactly who these people are because they're usually not carrying identification and the cops don't really care all that much and you know the rest of society i'm you know, you can say whatever you want about that, but it's, it's the reality. Um, yeah, it makes yeah, a lot and I, of sense. I tend to believe, yeah. And I tend to believe this part of the story too, because it, it's hard for people to understand, like we're constantly under surveillance and there's stuff like forensic evidence now, but in like the fifties, none of this stuff existed. There wasn't like cameras everywhere. You could easily just get away. You could easily just like kill somebody and like leave them on a park bench. And nobody would actually really know until probably maybe a day later, two days later, or even a couple hours later. And you, by that point, you're long gone. Yeah, you think about it. And the neighborhood he was doing it in, Hell's Kitchen, if you go to Hell's Kitchen today, it's full of cute coffee shops. And But that was back then was ground zero. It was a tough neighborhood in a tough city. And people were dying all the time. And some beat cops not going to take two seconds out of his time to really investigate a murder of a homeless person, you know, so it very likely that unless somebody actually saw Richard doing it, nobody would even not even not be the wiser. Nobody cared. Yeah. And you know, the like hell's kitchen too. Like we'll get into this with the Roy DeMail episode. I mean, this is where the Westies were from, which are infamous and i'm sure the cops didn't particularly like going into these neighborhoods in yeah. general because for the most part you would go in there and try to find out what happened and nobody would talk to you because everybody knew what would happen if you talked to the cops and and probably in general the people who lived in these neighborhoods didn't like talking to the cops in general like even if nothing was going to happen to them then the, it's it, it's interesting to bring up richard's first family for somebody who all he talked about in the iceman uh interviews was that he would do anything for his family and family 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 yeah, he had a family when he was young. I think he was still in his teens even when he had started his first family. He had three kids with his first wife who cheated on him and it was a whole thing. But he, then he just completely drops them, which is interesting to me. He, it really seemed to me like he hated them. 
Yeah, it's weird in the in the uh, Carlo uh, Carlo book. Like they mentioned, you had this family, and I mean, they talk about it for a little bit, but they don't really get into a ton of details, like what, exactly why Richard hated this family so much, and he didn't even really view the kids as his own. Maybe if she was sleeping around, maybe he did think, oh, there's a possibility that they're not even my kids, and you know, he kind of got stuck in this situation, I guess, to a degree where. Like you mentioned with his second family, it was like always he was always talking about his family, family, family. Maybe he felt the same way with this, but he was really young and it just didn't work out. And yeah. it's it, you know, the relationship in general kind of reminded him of the relationships, you know, his mother and his father probably had. And it's weird because in the book they talk about it and then it just kind of dropped. You just never hear about these people again. I mean, I guess they're lucky to a degree. They they dodge a bullet <laughs> for sure steve here again with a quick word from our sponsors then richard then the next phase of his life really is that he he tries to go straight he's a uh he works as a trucker and an unloader and it's interesting that he winds up working with and under Tony Provenzano, who was a major mafia figure and major player in the Teamsters Union, which will the Teamsters Union will come up in another uh, part of the conversation today. But he doesn't really handle that very well, that type of work. And at the he winds up getting a job in a uh, movie production facility where they're making duplicates of masters of Disney movies, I believe. And he uh, gets into some deals where he makes extra copies and then bootlegs them, which that sort of thing, like it sounds really scummy now. And it sounds like something that, you know, like you would get fired instantly. But I, I, I get the feeling like back in the 50s and the 60s that's just stuff that happened yeah and they would sell the bootlegs till you know they're not really bootlegs they're just copying the masters and yeah and selling them to like local theaters at like half the price right and i mean the local theaters are happy they get to make a few bucks it just seems like it's a win-win situation for everybody and the studios are still making a lot of money so they don't really care all that much yeah, it's not it's not like today where they're so uh, that copyright has become ironclad. And a lot of that started changing probably because they did over bootleg. But um, yeah. as a part of that, where Richard had this production facility for making tapes, um, real to real tapes, he gets into pornography and he really becomes a, a low end pornography peddler and that's really the big thing that he's doing but it's I, I get the read that it wasn't exactly illegal what he was doing some of it wasn't exactly illegal but it was something that the mafia was heavily involved in and that's probably that's really how he gets his first interactions with the mafia yeah yeah it was something that the mob was heavily involved in and i mean it depends on the, the stories that you believe like he was just doing like no, he was just peddling like kind of normal regular pornography but then there's there's stories about some of the more extreme stuff that apparently richard was peddling to and we'll get into that with the roy de mayo and um but yeah for, he was from my understanding he was really successful at it that's where he made a big chunk of his coin was uh distributing uh pornography and bootlegs he just seems like he was the type of person who he never, uh, he, I mean, he freely admitted it. As soon as he got money, he just blew it instantly. And at, during certain parts of his life, he was a gambler and he would gamble away all his money or he would drink all of his money or he would use it to buy hot cars, um, which will be interesting. That'll it'll bring us to some other interesting avenues. But he he was just a guy who, for I mean, for a gazillion reasons, even in the mafia game and in the crime game, he never seemed to be able to get ahead and get ahead of himself. Yeah, the 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 spending money as soon as you get it is um, and there's a, there's been research about this. People that grow up in like kind of extreme poverty, the way Richard did is um, 
they have this tendency to, as soon as they get it, they spend the money because they're worried that the next day it's not going to be there. And it's just kind of like a something that goes down from generations to generations. And you'll notice it in real life too, just if you're an observer in person, if you notice certain people that are not the greatest with money, if you kind of get to know them a little bit, it's there's usually a whole backstory to it. That's interesting you bring that up because I think that the, with a lot of the things with Richard Kuklinski, they were multipliers. You look at him yeah. and he is somebody who had zero impulse control. When somebody would give flip him off on the highway, he would just go berserk. And that's, he supposedly, or at least he claimed to have killed many people where he just went, went nuts. Impulse yeah. control or Barbara would talk about it. And his kids would talk about it where, and when he would just completely trash the house in fits of rage and people who have impulse control, a lot of times if they have money, they're just going to, they're going to spend it wantonly. And so I think that's another multiplier of that extreme poverty that he came out of that. You've got to spend money. You've got to look good. You've got to wear good clothes. You've got to have the car and then the impulse control to thinking, well, if I save some of this money, maybe I can reinvest it into, even if you're a, a criminal, I can reinvest it into more crime stuff. He didn't do that either. No, and it's, it's funny. You mentioned like, uh, it's one of the funnier things about his story is he used to buy like these really bright, like flashy suits with his money. Cause he just enjoyed like having flashy suits. And it, I don't know, just, I always found it kind of funny. Like you watch the Iceman interviews from the HBO documentaries, and then you read his story and then the, this guy's rocking out like a baby blue, like or yellow suit. It just, yeah. like, it's just, it's, and it's funny, you know, but it's like one of these things that's, uh, I mean, that makes him like a larger than life character. I mean, he really does kind of come across as like a comic book villain. We're going to leave it at that for today. I just want to mention, though, the best thing you can do to help us in this podcast is if you enjoy what you're hearing, tell a friend, tell a couple of friends about the podcast so that your friends can become friends of ours. 